Thank you for joining this session, Developing a Culture of Safety in Biomedical Research. My name is Liza Bundeson, and I work in the NIH Office of Extramural Research. I'm your moderator for this 45-minute session. Our presenter today is Dr. John Lorsch, Director of the National Institute of General Medical Sciences, or NIGMS. The format today includes a short presentation followed by Q&A. So let's get started. Dr. Lorsch, you have our attention. Thank you, Liza. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Excellent. Thank you. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us um, for this seminar and looking forward to your questions. I wanted to tell you a little bit about our thinking recently on how to develop a culture of safety in biomedical research and why we think this is a critical area for institutions and investigators to be focusing more attention on. So if we were in person, I would ask for a show of hands, but since we aren't in person, uh, I will just pretend you're showing hands and ask a question of how many of you know the name Sherry Sangji? Um, and normally when I put this up, unfortunately, not that many people raise their hands. Um, so Sherry Sangji was a, a recently graduated um, student who was, became a technician in a lab at UCLA, in a chemistry lab at UCLA. Um, and was performing a, um, a chemical synthesis step in which she was using a pyrogenic chemical, a T-butyl lithium. And she had not actually received proper training uh, and how to use this chemical. Um, she put it into a large plastic, um, plastic syringe in order to um, transfer it from the bottle in order, into a reaction vessel. And it's a pyrogenic reagent, which means that when it comes in contact with air, it can spontaneously ignite and uh, catch fire. Um, and when she went to transfer um, the t lithium, uh, the stopper came out of the syringe and it sprayed onto her clothing. She wasn't wearing a lab coat, um, unfortunately, and um, her clothes uh, and skin caught fire. Uh, and she was burned over a very significant fraction of her body. And unfortunately, a couple of weeks after this happened, um, she succumbed and passed away from her injuries. So this was a terrible tragedy uh, in an academic lab. In addition to her, her, her death, which was obviously um, the worst thing that could have possibly happened, um, the, um, the, the institution and the PI both had criminal charges filed against them uh, for negligence in this case. Um, and that led to uh, eventually a settlement, but a huge financial cost to the institution um, and a variety of um, penalties uh, that were put in place. One of the things that was put in place uh, in response to Sherry Sangji's death um, was that the University of California, Los Angeles started the UC Center for Laboratory Safety, which is uh, become actually one of the foremost um, centers uh, in the country and possibly the world for focusing on evidence-based um, ways to enhance safety in laboratory settings and to build cultures of safety at research institutions. And so I would actually commend uh, this website to you um, as a starting point for anyone wishing to think more about how to improve the culture of safety at their institution. They have quite a lot of resources available um, and uh, a number of case studies and reports and, and other things that will be useful um, to you in thinking about this. Now, in addition to this tr terrible tragedy of Sherry Sangji's death uh, in the lab, there have been another, a number of other um, high profile accidents um, that make useful case studies in thinking about just how tragic um, and destructive a lapse in safety can be um, and a, a lapse in safety as we'll talk about is generally caused um, by deficiencies in institutional culture and institutional policies um, and procedures. So in 2006, for example, um, there was um, at, the, at Texas A&M University, um, a, an accident that luckily and just really through uh, freak fate um, did not uh, injure anybody but could have killed multiple people um, had it happened at the wrong time, in which a liquid nitrogen tank had been modified to have both of its pressure release valves sealed at some point in the past. This was probably done um, because those valves were failing and rather than replace the tank, somebody, and, and I don't think it was ever uh, ascertained who it was, um, had um, sealed one valve and then the other. 
Uh, and because the tank was used fairly frequently, the pressure was vented just by using the tank. Um, but at some point um, that didn't happen. Um, and in the middle of the night, I think around 3 a.m. in the morning in this chemistry lab, um, the tank actually failed and it couldn't release the pressure and thus it exploded. And it basically turned into a missile um, and it, uh, the bottom exploded off. It blew a hole in the floor. Um, it rained shrapnel um, from the tile in the floor in the lab below it and in the, the room it was in, completely demolished the room. The walls blew out, the door blew out. And then the tank itself um, uh, went through the ceiling of the room into the uh, mechanical room that was above it, um, went through the water main line um, in that mechanical room, which then of course uh, flooded the, the lab and the building. Um, and so again, had this happened when somebody was there, multiple people would have been probably killed, um, if not seriously injured. And just by fate, um, it happened in the middle of the night, thank goodness. Uh, but this, this shows you, again, the, the kind of thing that can happen um, and happen very quickly um, if uh, there is not a sufficient culture of safety um, at the institution. Um, Somewhat more recently in 2016 at the University of Hawaii, uh, researchers doing bioenergy studies were growing bacteria under atmospheres containing hydrogen gas and oxygen gas. Um, the day before this actual uh, disaster took place, there had been a small, what we call a sentinel event in which they were doing the experiment on a smaller scale and there had been a small detonation um, that took place. Uh, unfortunately, uh, despite the fact that the postdoc um, actually made the PI aware of this event, the decision was made the next day to scale up the experiment uh, and to continue rather than using the sentinel event to uh, bring everything to a halt. And uh, what it turned out appears to have happened is the static electricity um, built up either on the investigator or on the apparatus or both uh, and ignited the gas mixture, which led the tank to explode. And so you can see the aftermath of that explosion um, here in this picture. The postdoc um, miraculously wasn't killed, but lost an arm and suffered other serious injuries during this accident. Um, and in addition to the, that, that tragedy, then of course, um, the university um, was fined um, significant amounts of money and there are ongoing legal um, issues related to this. The university um, commissioned the University of California Center for Laboratory Safety to write a report um, on this um, accident. There were actually two parts to the report that they wrote, um, but basically in a nutshell, the report concluded that um, the explosion um, was the ultimate result of systemic safety failures um, within the organization. They make the point, as I'll tell you, that uh, this is not in any way unique to the University of Hawaii. So just to give you a few other examples of tragic lab accidents that have occurred in recent years. At the University, University of Chicago, a researcher was working with an attenuated strain of Yersinia pestis. This is the bacteria that causes bubonic plague or the Black Death. Um, it was thought that the strain was um, not pathogenic um, because it had been attenuated in its ability to take up iron from the host. And iron is an essential uh, element for the growth and the pathogenesis of the bacteria. Um, however, unknown to the researcher working with the strain, um, he had um, hemochromatosis, so elevated iron levels in his blood, which apparently um, compensated for the deficiency of the strain in its ability to take up iron and allowed it to become pathogenic again. Um, the CDC, um, which published a report on this particular uh, event, um, concluded that um, in addition to that fact, um, they, that there was an inconsistent use of gloves in the laboratory and thus that was a likely factor um, in, this, in this tragic accident. At Yale, an undergraduate uh, was working in the lab at night by herself, uh, working actually in a machine shop associated with the laboratory, um, working with a lathe, which as you may know, is a very rapidly sprinting um, a machine um, with a blade, uh, the sharp blade for carving things. Um, and her hair got caught in the lathe um, and that led to her asphyxiation 
and death. So these are just unfortunately some examples of the tragedies that have happened over the past decade or so uh, in lab accidents across the country. Um, the UC Center for Lab Safety concluded um, in the, of the University of Hawaii, their report, um, that many other institutions also tolerate poor safety cultures and practices. Um, and therefore, uh, there's a direct call to action for research, researchers and ministers, administrators, uh, university health and safety officials um, at all institutions of higher education to conduct research to take um, developing better cultures of lab safety much more seriously than has been done in the past. And then even more recently, um, you may have seen this uh, actually this year, just in July, um, there were two cases in France um, of a fatal prion disease, uh, Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease in, in researchers, um, at least one of which possibly both were linked to infections that the researchers likely got while they were working in the laboratory. And that led France to actually issue a moratorium on prion research um, until they could investigate and, and improve lab safety practices. So unlike what some people think that this problem of lab safety and significant accidents is um, limited to chemistry, um, that's clearly not the case. We have seen cases in biology as well in a number of different disciplines and fields. And I should say, I'm just showing you some of the, the bigger, um, more high profile cases, but if you start to dig into it, you will find many, many different um, smaller cases, what you might even call sentinel events, um, involving all sorts of different um, kinds of research, different kinds of instruments, different kinds of procedures. Um, I suspect all of you, if you think back on your own careers, can probably come up fairly easily with four or five different examples of um, accidents of, of different levels of severity that you have uh, witnessed. I personally, uh, have witnessed explosions of um, of ovens, of, you know, vacuum sealed ovens, of um, ultra centrifuges. I've put out fires in um, probably three or four different times of students um, dipping um, spreaders into ethanol and then into the flame, you know, to spread a, a sterilize a plate, uh, to spread on a plate, and then dripping the flaming ethanol back into the beaker. Um, I've seen people nearly electrocute themselves uh, on gel boxes. So. Um, those are all near misses. Those are all sentinel events because none of them led to uh, injury or disaster um, other than loss of equipment in some cases. But all of them could have become disasters um, and all of them tell us something about what we could and should be doing better um, in, in developing cultures of safety. So what to do about um, this situation? NIGMS has been focusing on this in a number of different ways. In all of our training FOAs now, we have um, strengthened and added language related to safety. And we mean safety very broadly. We mean safety in terms of a safe environment, uh, free, of, free from harassment, intimidation, um, um, and um, incivil behavior. But we also certainly mean safety in terms of the physical laboratory or clinical settings. So for example, in the program considerations section of our training FOAs, it says safety and research training should encompass all of these things, including laboratory and clinical settings where individuals exercise the highest standards of practice for chemical, biological, and physical safety, and in which leadership um, and the research community emphasize safety over competing goals, such as getting that next high profile paper out. We require an institutional letter uh, and one of the things that has to be in that letter is ensuring that the research and clinical facilities, as well as the laboratory and clinical practices promote the safety of our trainees. And then the review criteria, uh, they are asked to look um, at this and uh, review it in terms of what's being taught in the didactic and mentored portions of the curriculum and whether or not uh, th that, that the institutional commitment is sufficient to develop and promote a culture of safety and safety of the trainees. So those are just some examples, but it's propagated throughout the entire funding opportunity announcements. We've done another, a number of other things in order to try to promote um, an interest amongst the community, particularly in our training community, since NIGMS, NIGMS has such a large footprint in training. Um, we had at our 
semi-annual or a twice uh, every other year biennial, I guess that is, um, work uh, training workforce development and diversity program directors meeting a session uh, a couple of years ago about laboratory safety um, in which Craig Merlick, the director of the UC Center for Laboratory Safety spoke. I can say he gave a truly uh, riveting presentation, uh, much better than the one I'm giving to you. So if you get a chance to hear him, I certainly encourage you to hear him, um, in which he really, I think, caught people's attention and gave them something to focus on in terms of how to move forward with trying to improve the cultures of safety uh, at their institutions. And we actually asked everyone you know, in real time to rate the meetings and his session was by far the highest rating at, uh, rated at the entire meeting. We also um, have over the last few years provided administrative supplements to our training grants to allow institutions to develop new curricular activities that are related to safety and improving the cultures of safety. I have to confess, overall, I've been disappointed in the number of applications we've gotten in this space. We've gotten a few that, that really seem to be quite innovative and the institutions are taking this seriously and doing some really interesting things that I hope um, will uh, kind of come to fruition and then be disseminated throughout the community. But by and large, the number of applications we've gotten has not been um, that great. And I think unfortunately it suggests uh, maybe that the community still is not focusing on this, um, this issue uh, sufficiently, despite, as I showed you at the beginning, the extremely high cost um, in life and eventually in, in other things as well um, that could result if it's not taken more seriously. We also have had uh, actual grant um, proposals, um, funding opportunities for R25s to develop safety training modules, so shareable, free, uh, online modules related to safety. Um, and the opportunity is shown there. It was in fiscal year of 20. And hopefully those, those um, will be coming out uh, in the next year or so and can be incorporated into uh, institutions training curriculum. Uh, into an individual lab's um, efforts uh, or in, in other ways. We, are gonna, we have a clearinghouse that we developed on our website that links to training materials and will link to those um, modules once they're developed. And you can see the link for that there. And it provides a number of other links that um, are useful as well if you're interested in trying to develop um, and incorporate more um, teaching about safety protocols and how to develop a culture of safety into your curriculum. We're also encouraging programs, and this is actually in our funding opportunity announcements as well, to think about teaching not to academic standards in terms of things such as safety, um, and also in terms of perhaps things such as uh, re rigor and reproducibility, um, but perhaps the industry standards instead, um, and certainly for safety, industry standards are considerably higher um, than they are in academia. Um, and although that may seem like an unnecessary burden uh, it, to, to incorporate into your, your teaching and your curriculum, if you think about it, not only will it improve the safety culture at your institution, reducing the risk of somebody getting hurt or, um, you know, God forbid, killed, um, but it will also make your students uh, more marketable uh, when they go on the job market, uh, at least in terms of going to industry, because industry is not going to have to retrain them the way they tell us they have to do now. So that's really something to think about is aim higher than you need to be for uh, where you are, and it'll be to everyone's benefit. We're also hoping to partner with professional societies um, in, in this regard and to find ways that we can work with them to promote um, this culture, the development of this culture of safety throughout the academia um, and give people additional resources for trying to, to do that at their own institutions. One uh, organization I should certainly give a lot of kudos to uh, has been the American Chemical Society, which I think was really galvanized um, by Sherry Sangji's death uh, because it was in a chemi chemistry lab. Um, and their journals um, in uh, 2016 um, actually enacted new safety policies and authors are required to address any novel or significant hazards uh, in the work they describe. And I think that's something that they're to be commended for and maybe other journals and other societies that have journals should think about how they can do something similar um, in, in their journals. 
We, for our part, have been trying to use our bully pulpit. And as I told you, in terms of our funding opportunities, also our uh, policies and um, the money we distribute to the community to support research and training. We have had a feedback loop. This is our blog post that um, we, we put out to inform the community of what uh, is going on at NIGMS. We had a blog post about um, safety, training, re uh, safety uh, training resources um, and uh, these issues in general. And we also actually wrote a paper. Uh, we were invited by the American Society for Cell Biology um, to write a paper about this subject in the molecular biology of the cell. Um, and that's shown on the right, and there's a link uh, to it on the bottom. Um, and actually they were um, very kind and made this an open access paper uh, so that anyone can get it uh, without um, actually subscribing to MBOC. So I encourage you to take a look at that. It has additional information in it that may be useful. So some more specific things then that institutions uh, can do as they're thinking about how they're going to train students and teach students um, in, in the classroom, in the labs, uh, and, and in other places. One thing that became clear from reading the literature um, that should definitely be incorporated into teaching students about experimental design, which is something that we're strongly encouraging every uh, training program um, to be teaching students explicitly uh, in their coursework, uh, experimental design, um, is how to do a hazard assessment. Um, and this, I won't go through it all, but this shows the steps of a ha hazard assessment where uh, you educate yourself on uh, what sorts of um, hazards there can be and how to mitigate them. As you're developing the protocol and the experimental design, you are thinking about where at each step um, the, the concerns could arise. Uh, you incorporate any information you have about accidents that actually happened or near misses. You look at uh, literature that's available. You conduct a what if analysis and brainstorm on what could go wrong and what you will do if it does go wrong. And then you write out what to do and what not to do at each step in order to minimize the risks. And if there is a, a, a problem, what to do about it. Um, and so, you know, by explicitly incorporating this into students thinking and how they learn to design an experiment, um, you can dramatically reduce the risk of um, something going wrong. Um, and you will begin to develop this culture where everybody is thinking about how do we prevent um, disasters and accidents from happening. I think it's really also important to teach students to question their assumptions. Um, you know, you can assume that everything's fine, the experiment's gonna go right, uh, and I'll just do it because, you know, that somebody told me to do it this way, or, you know, it, it's, it was written up this way in a paper. Uh, but making people really think, again, going along with uh, the experimental design about, is that really true? Um, is it true that this is safe? Is it true that um, I can do it this way without something bad happening? And it was one example, I'm showing these pictures because in doing research on this area, I learned something I did not know, which is the white lab coats that most of us have used throughout our careers are neither uh, flame resistant um, nor solvent and chemical resistant. Um, so they can catch fire easily. Uh, and if you spill uh, a chemical on them, say phenol, it will go through them and into your skin. Um, and therefore, uh, and not only that, if you think about them, they all have open cuffs. And so going back to the issue I was mentioning before, um, I have certainly seen uh, people take their open cuffs and accidentally go through a bunts and burner with them. Of course, you know, you can see um, what can happen there. So I made everyone in my lab uh, re replace the white coats we had with uh, these kinds of blue coats where the cuffs are elasticized so they're not open and they are resistant both to flame uh, and to solvents and chemical spills. And it costs more money, but uh, not that much more money. And if you think about uh, the terrible tragedy you could prevent by having a coat like this, um, you know, I think it certainly was worth it. Uh, and so again, that's an assumption. I assumed white lab coats, everyone used them. They were, they were fine. They were the best, best thing you could get. And it turns out not really true. Um, and so uh, you can certainly learn something by questioning your assumptions. Now, another area we're interested in um, facilitating more and getting institutions to think about um, is how to bring their core facilities into the teaching mission of the institution 
Um, and this can have a variety of benefits, including helping to build this culture of safety. Um, so for instance, um, you could bring your core facilities into the lecture-based part of your curriculum. You certainly could incorporate them into active learning courses where students are actually you know, doing things to uh, learn um, new skills, learn how to interpret data, learn how to conduct an experiment, how to design an experiment. Um, and, and they could be a, a central part of that activity. Because they spend all their time doing certain kinds of procedures with certain kinds of equipment, they should be the people that know uh, what the best practices are, both in terms of safety uh, and also in terms of rigor and reproducibility. So um, they could do things like um, introduce, so, so doing this, incorporating cores into teaching could introduce students to those cores that were available for research, which could you know, benefit them when they get into the labs because they'll know what's out there and, and what techniques, <coughs> excuse me, and approaches um, are available on site or, or elsewhere nearby. They could help promote safety practices, as I said. They could teach students about uh, standard operating procedures and how to use them and how to write them, uh, how to use the equipment uh, as rigorously as possible and how to do the data interpretation as rigorously as possible. And this could happen all at the same time if they're incorporated into your, uh, the, your didactic curriculum. Um, the other benefit of it for an, any of you who are core, core facility directors or are you know, vice presidents of research and think about uh, the dollars and cents and, and the, the worth to the mission is that by doing this, it gives the cores an additional value to the institution. They're now just not, not just part of the research infrastructure, but they're part of the educational infrastructure. And I think that double win uh, may further increase their value. So this is a figure, um, final figure from our paper, and it shows what institutions can do or some of the things institutions can do to enhance their cultures of safety and what NIGMS has been doing uh, to help them do that. So I won't go through of all the things because I've, I've, I've talked about most of them already, uh, but you know they start with the top. The, the leaders of the institution need to have the values and behaviors to emphasize safety both in the laboratory and the clinical setting, as well as safety in terms of um, safety from harassment, civility, uh, lack of intimidation, et cetera. And that will cascade downwards um, so that if they make, uh, if the deans, uh, the provosts, et cetera, make clear that this is uh, a priority for them, that will get to the department chairs, it will get to the PIs, and then they will help um, teach their students um, to, to operate in that sort of a culture. And it cascades from there into more, um, more concrete things. On our part, I told you about things we're doing in terms of funding, uh, in terms of the policies within our funding announcements, in terms of the new funding programs that we have to try to help institutions develop these cultures of safety. Um, but any additional thoughts that people have on what institutions could do, how NIH and NIGMS could help them do it, I think would be uh, very valuable um, to discuss. So with that, I'd like to open it to questions or comments and I will end the show there and stop sharing. Great, thank you, John, for that compelling presentation. Um, so as a reminder, please enter your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And we already have a few for you. Um, so one attendee asks, uh, does NIH evaluate in any way the safety and security um, in the labs that NIH funds? So um, again, in, in NIGMS's training grants, um, the applicants, the institutions are asked to provide a significant amount of information related to this, um, and that's then evaluated by reviewers. So that's one place that it happens. Um, it is an expectation of all NIH grants that the research be conducted in a safe environment. Um, but uh, in, you know, it, it, in general, uh, we don't go and, and, and uh, do site visits at every institution to check that. It's more when something goes wrong um, that that would happen. Um, although in some of the bigger awards uh, during site visits, that could be something that could come up. Thank you. Um, for small businesses, how much additional training does NIH recommend once the available NIH lab safety training modules have been completed? Well, so businesses um, are generally covered under different 
um, regulations and laws than than an academic institution um, because OSHA is involved in those cases. So, um, and it's actually a complication of this space that um, that OSHA does not have jurisdiction in general um, over uh, students at academic institutions, um, which is, is, you know, makes it a little more difficult there. But for small businesses, they are covered. Um, and therefore, um, you would have to comply with what their requirements are as well. Thank you. Uh, another attendee asks, do you know of similar safety institutes like UCLA devoted to safety protocols or standards for other research environments? And the individual notes, we've had to develop, for example, our own safety protocols for field research workers in mm -hmm. South Asian urban environments. Perhaps there's a market for these additional research settings such as epidemiology, field trials as well. I think that's an excellent point. And I think there's a big opportunity to increase the resources that are available in the space. And that's why we have this funding opportunity announcement for the R25s. Um, what I would en encourage you to do actually is to contact uh, the UC Center um, and discuss where the holes are. I know that Craig Merlick has, He's, he's not limited by any means just to chemistry. They're, they're broadly thinking about you know, safety within all the research conducted at the University of California, which of course encompasses just about everything. Um, and in his talk, he, will, he talks about field work as well, um, particularly um, a case where researchers were studying monkeys and they were collecting samples. Um, I can't remember ex exactly what it was from the monkeys, but um, they were the monkeys were urinating on them from the trees and you know they were not properly protected um, from that so uh, this is a, a a problem that he has recognized for sure so I would encourage you to talk to him about what more can be done as well. Thank you. Um, does NIH require biosafety approval at the pre-award stage? Um, that's an interesting quote at the pre-award stage. I mean, I think the university has to comply with appropriate regulations. Um, you know, as a general issue, each grant is not assessed independently, you know, each time, but the institution itself has to um, be in compliance for safety. And if there are special things like, um, you know, higher biosafety levels, that would have to be appropriately um, approved. And how likely is it that NIH could provide supplements to research grants to improve safety? So uh, for the training grants, as I mentioned at NIGMS, we have done that for a couple of years. Um, and the reason we chose the training grants was because we have a very large footprint and because we think that um, they provide us a significant lever within an institution. They, they, they affect a lot of people within the institution and therefore um, it's a way to, you know, get, get the attention of, of an institution and help change its culture by giving them some additional resources. Um, individual grants, I think, you know, an R01, that would be a little challenging because that would be very piecemeal and there'd be so many of them. Um, but perhaps, you know, this could be expanded to larger center grants, for example, um, at institutions. Um, so I think that would be something to explore. Okay. So you provided a number of ideas for what institutions could do. If there were one or two of your top that could be the most impactful, what do you think they would be? So um, I, I think that's an excellent question. I think two things I would say. One, this cascades from the top. So it really needs to be something that the vice president for research, the dean, um, makes clear that the department chairs are going to be assessed on. You know, I, I would actually put it in people's assessments, um, their performance plans, um, and that will help build the culture. And then they will ensure, you know, since they're going to be assessed on it uh, in terms of their performance, uh, they will want to make sure the laboratories in their department are, are at, at the you know, cutting edge of safety. Um, one of my former council members used to be at Merck, a vice president at Merck, and he, he was in charge of their safety program. And he said that um, he personally did rounds once a month through all their labs 
um, for safety to do safety inspections. And that really sent a message that, you know, the vice president uh, is coming with a team to check all the labs for safety. Um, the other thing I would say is the second um, one, again, gets back to that education and training piece that um, this shouldn't be, safety should not be something that students get a two hour session on from the environmental health and safety group, you know, their first day in graduate school, and then that's the end of it, right? Which is unfortunately what it is at most places. It should be incorporated throughout the curriculum, just like rigor and reproducibility should be incorporated throughout the curriculum. Um, it should not be separated from how to plan a good experiment. It should be absolutely integral to planning a good experiment, just like rigor and reproducibility should be. Um, it should be reinforced continually. So they should come back to it again and again in the first year in different, different settings and different ways. Um, and then in the mentored phase of the research, um, there should be uh, checks in place to make sure that the mentors are reinforcing this. Um, because even if you teach them it in the first year, you can unlearn it all again later if you know the older graduate students and the postdocs are saying, oh yeah, they said wear a lab coat, but uh, you know, who needs to do that? Or they said to wear safety glasses, who needs to do that? You know, these kinds of things. So, um, but that's again, getting to this overarching issue of, it's about the culture. Um, it's about developing a culture of safety, not just a single point um, safety. I'll just say one other thing, in terms of EA, you know, environmental health and safety, um, these people are often viewed as kind of, you know, the enemy, they're gonna come to our lab and, and fine us or shut us down or whatever. Uh, in general, they're just trying to make sure that nothing bad happens so that everybody can continue doing their research. Um, and so I would really encourage you to bring them into the, the education training program. Don't have them as a separate thing again. Um, bring them in, incorporate them, get their advice, have them you know, give a lecture, have them uh, helping teach something in the cores. Um, so I, I think that's a really important point as well. That's excellent. Thank you. Well, it looks like we don't have any more questions in the Q&A. Um, so I think we can wrap up. Um, thank you, John, for such an informative session. Thank and, you. And, yeah, it was wonderful. And, and to the attendees, if you do have additional questions, please visit our exhibit hall staff for chat and one-on-one -on -one opportunities, or you can always find contact information in the help section of our grants.nih.gov website. And also uh, your feedback is very important to us. So please take a moment to let us know what you thought by clicking on the session feedback button located within the description and presenters on the auditorium list of sessions. When you're completely finished with the seminar, please also complete the overall survey form in the navigation bar at the top of the page. So thank you again and everyone have a great day.